In Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, um, Mishnah 8. So, this Mishnah is talking about Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shatach. And as I said, until this Mishnah, both Yehuda ben Tabai and uh, Shimon, uh, ex- Yehuda ben Tabai, and Yeshua ben Trach, uh, Prachia, and Itai Arbeli, it all seems to be Kohanim. Because I mentioned that the Kohanim, who were the teachers in antiquity, I mentioned this in previous Mishnayot, uh, it was seen a good thing that they be the president of the Sanhedrin when they were scholars. However, in our particular case, the Maharal points out it's not clear who was the Nasi here, who was actually the president. Was it Yehuda ben Tabai or was it Shimon ben Shetach? Because uh, in one place it says Shimon ben Shetach was the president and in another place it says it was Yehuda ben Tabai who was uh, the, the president. So there's a certain uh, non-clarity uh, here about this uh, issue. Who exactly was the president of the, uh, of the Sanhedrin? So the answer seems to be that uh, the Talmud says, tells a story. It says that Yehuda ben Tabai was the president. And we also know that Yehuda ben Tabai, during the time of Alexander Janus, who is called King Yanai, which was actually a Hasmonean king. Um, he tried, he battled against the Pharisees, against the Prushim, and sided with the Tzdukim. We have a Hasmonean king who took a liking to the Sadducees, maybe because they were also Kohanim, and the Hasmonean family were Kohanim too. And he gave a lot of problems to the, the rabbis of the Prushim, and um, and the one and Yehuda ben Tabai ran off to Egypt just like before him. Uh, so did um, uh, so did Yehoshua ben Prachia. And if you remember the story, not only and it says that Shimon ben Shatach, as we said last time, sent him a letter telling him to come back. The times are good now. And uh, on the other hand, the same thing happened with Yehuda ben Tabai. Yehuda ben Tabai also had a runoff to Egypt because of King Yanai, Alexander Janus, and eventually he came back to be with Shimon ben Shatach. Why was Shimon ben Shatach, um, and Shimon ben Shatach actually also spent some time supposedly in Egypt, but he, why exactly was it easier for him than the other rabbis? Well, the Talmud claims that Shimon ben Shatach was the brother of Shlom Tzion, the queen. Now, if he's the brother of Shlom Tzion, Shlom Tzion was the um, was the mother of Alexander Janus. That's what the Talmud seems to imply. There are some who speculate that he was related somehow, but not through this connection. But the Talmud definitely says that his sister was Shlom Tzion, and uh, of course, the Talmud in one place seems to imply that she was married to Alexander Janus. Another place that if she was Shlom Tzion, she herself is a queen. Um, Anyhow, the, the point is that he was connected to the royalty through his sister, and he used this connection, I guess, to have a certain amount of immunity in the, these issues. And a story like this we actually find in the Talmud in Sanhedrin. In the Talmud of Sanhedrin, page 19, we see how Shimon Bachatak was fearless when it came to dealing with with the king. And the story goes like this. The Talmud says, a king should not be judged or be a judge. It's lodan uh, velodanimoto. The king has to be different, of course, than the court. The court is the court and the king is the king. But it's also not a good idea to judge a king because the king might try reprisal against the court. So it's better just to leave the court out of it. So that's what it says. Uh, so then the Torah, the uh, Gemara brings um, why the kings of Israel are different. Why can't they be judged? So the Gemara says, these restrictions were imposed because of an incident which occurred. The incident was that a slave of King Yanai, King Janus, killed a person. And Shimon ben Shatach, who at that time was the head of the Sanhedrin, and I have to explain where I have to explain how this happened. How was it 
that Shimon Bar Shatach became the president of the Sanhedrin if Yudha ben Tabai was the president of the Sanhedrin. So again, the, the, the Babylonian Talmud tells a story. And the story was that when Yehuda ben Tabai was the president, he wanted to make a statement about bearing false witnesses. It seems that everybody here was trying to strengthen the power of the court. Maybe at this point, they already understood that the power of the king was starting to fall, or at least to fall out with Judaism, because Alexander Janus liked the Sadducees, and they wanted to strengthen the courts more. And to strengthen the court, you also have to do court reforms, which they are talking about. So um, the story is that um, Yehuda ben Tabai wanted to make a statement. Now, you have a false witness, which is called an aid zomeim. It's, there are different types of false witnesses. An aid zomeim is somebody who says, this person did such and such. And then another pair of witnesses come and say, there's no way this person did such and such because they were with us at that time and they obviously couldn't do that. So then we know that the first pair were false witnesses. However, if only one of the first pair was a false witness, you cannot implement judgment. It has to be the two pair, the second pair of witnesses has to say that the first pair of witnesses were invalid in order to punish them. Punish them. If you said that one was invalid, yes, the pair falls apart and we don't listen to them. But to actually punish them, you have to be able to charge both of them to be able to prove the point. So it says that Yehuda ben Tamai actually killed a false witness who tried to bring the death penalty on somebody incorrectly because there it says about that type of false witness, um, kasher zamam, you're supposed to do to them what they wanted to do to the other. However, after the, he enacted the, his rulement, and supposedly this guy got the death penalty, Shimon ben Shatach told him it was a big mistake because he was only one. And only when the pair, the whole pair, um, is proven to be uh, false witnesses do you enact uh, judgment against them. And it says that when Yehuda ben Tabai realized his mistake, he resigned from the presidency of the Sanhedrin and told Shimon ben Shatach, I'm now under you, whatever you decide, that will be the law. So basically it switched over in the middle. So here, even though in this pair, Yehuda ben Tabai is presented as the president and Shimon ben Shatach as the head of the court, it appears that they switched around eventually um, after this mistake happened and Shimon ben Shatach became the president and Yehuda ben Tabai was the head of uh, the court. Now, the story which is told in Sanhedrin 19 is also very interesting, and it says something about Shimon ben Shatach, and we have to see these people really together as a pair. So the story goes that the Talmud says, how come we're not supposed to uh, judge a king? Why is a king different than anybody else? The Talmud says it's not really that we're not supposed to, but there's a problem. And the problem is based on a story. There was a slave of King Yanai who killed a person. And Shimon ben Shatach, who at the time was the head of the Sanhedrin, said to the sages of the Sanhedrin, set your eyes upon the accused, meaning the slave and the king, because the king owes, owes the slave. Um, in those days, slaves were property, obviously. So the owner had to be there too, the king, and take responsibility for what the slave did. And we shall judge him. So the sages sent the message to Yanai, your slave killed somebody. You have to take responsibility. So he sent the slave <laughs> and to go, go to court. Um, but then, of course, Shalchuli, the sages, then sent another message to Yanai. You have to come too, because it says, the verse says, and the owner has to be warned by the witnesses. You are the owner. You're also responsible. You have to be there. The Torah says, um, that the owner has to be there. Okay, so King Yanai came to the court and he sat down. So Shimon ben Shatach, who was the head of the court, he got up and said to him, King Yanai, stand on your feet and let the witnesses testify against you. Because in court, when you are being um, testified against, you have to stand. And remember that you're not standing just as the judges, you are standing before he who spoke and made the world into being. You're standing before God. This is a court of the Lord. 
because it says the, the and they bring a verse to prove this. So Yanai said to Shimon ben Shatach, "I'm hearing what you're saying, but I don't want to act in accordance with what you're saying unless all your comrades, all your colleagues agree." In other words. It's true, you, the president of the Sanhedrin, told me to stand on my feet, but if all your colleagues are willing to join together in unison, then I'm willing to do it. So Shimon ben Shatach took turns of the judges on the right, and they all put their heads down because they were afraid. He turned to the judges on the left, they all put their heads down because they were afraid. So then Shimon ben Shatach said to them, you are men of thoughts. May the master of thoughts exact retribution against you. Meaning all you do is think, you don't talk. <laughs> so, so God, who is the God of thoughts, he will pay you back for that. And then, of course, the Talmud, in a very uh, poetic uh, way, says that angel Gabriel came down and whatever, whatever it was. But from that time on, they said a king should neither judge nor be judged because... Sanhedrin was too afraid of their power. Um, but here you see also, Shimon Meshatach obviously had some connection. So the fact that the Talmud said that he was the brother of Shlom Tzion, uh, the queen, there is some connection here, obviously, um, which is giving him some type of immunity because obviously he is willing to stand up. He's also the one who brings back the rabbis from uh, Alexandria, the Pharisees, the Prussian, when they ran away from King Yanai, Alexander Janus. So obviously there is something going on um, in his ability. And remember, Janus doesn't say he has no problem spe speaking to the king, and the king sort of realizes this, but realizes the other one don't have the don't have the gall to do uh, what Shimon Mashatach is willing uh, to do. So getting back to this. Now, there are two parts. So this Mishnah is talking about Yehuda ben Tabai. So that was our introduction. What does Yehuda ben Tabai say? Both Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shatach are talking about courts of law. And a lot of people wonder why. Why all of a sudden talking about court? Before, we talked about what the world stands on. We talked about a man's house. We talked about his friends. <laughs> How, all of a sudden, you're talking about courts. Um, it's not clear, but what I think is happening here is when you're reestablishing yourself, you're reestablishing the Sanhedrin, first of all, as a court of law. And remember, there was a lot of friction between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And Alexander Yanai took the side of the, of the Sadducees in this particular case. So the fight of, of Shimon ben Shatach is to bring back the power of the, of the Pharisees against the Sadducees, who, of course, stood in the temple and against the king, which is not a very simple fight. So he brings Joshua ben Prachia back from Egypt, and he brings Yehuda ben Tabai back from Egypt, and maybe others too who we do not know. And the idea is to establish the Pharisees, and it seems historically that he was able to do that uh, at this point against the Sadducees. Now, what does Yehuda ben Tabai says? Another thing, the Maharal, if you mention, as I mentioned last time, points out that with each pair, the first one talks in the positive, the second one is the negative, because the positive represents love and the negative represents fear. Here it's the exact opposite. The first one, Yehuda ben Tabai, talks about the negative, and the second one, Shimon ben Shatach, talks about the positive. So the Maral explains that's because they switched around later, because later on Shimon ben Shatach became the president and Yehuda ben Tabai became the head of the court, that's why it switched around. He says, theoretically, Shimon ben Shatach should be first. But the reason why they put Yehuda ben Tabai first is that he was the first president of the Sanhedrin, and only later Shimon ben Shatach became the president of the Sanhedrin. So I will read it in the way which it is written here. Yehuda ben Tabai says, do not make yourself like Orche Hadayanim. Rashi explains what's our Orche Hadayanim, those who set the laws. Rashi says you read it with an, like an Aleph, those who set up the laws. What does it mean they set up the laws? Who sets up the laws? Usually in a, in a biblical court, you come before the judge or three judges or whatever amount of judges, and it's the two people arguing between each other. They didn't have the idea of a lawyer. But here it looks like the Orchea Dayanim, the way it's explained, sounds very much like a lawyer. 
In fact, I'll read to you some of the descriptions of these Orchei HaDayanim, the way it's brought down. I think I saw one here when I wrote to Rabbi Natan. Uh, about the Orchei HaDayanim. Um, one second, I can't find it that quickly, so I will just bring it from here, from Rashi. So Rashi says, what is Orchei HaDayanim? Orchei HaDayanim, he says, those who are misader tanotav, they're helping somebody make their arguments in order to win the case. And the Talmud didn't like people like this because they're helping you win an argument whether they agree with you or not, which we all know is exactly what lawyers do, right? <laughs> so, and the Parshanim have a problem with people like this. What do you mean you're helping them win the case? So it's not about truth, it's about winning. Okay, there's a really a lot. So don't make yourself like Orchea Dianim, according to this, according to this according to this interpretation, is then don't be those who just look to win. You're looking for the truth. You're not looking to win. So this interpretation is very much against the idea of having a lawyer to defend yourself because he might actually take your case even if he doesn't agree. Uh, today the counter argument is that po most people don't really know the law very well. So you need a lawyer in order to present your case. So really, the lawyer is just trying to help you present your case the best that you can. I mean, that's the official reason why there is a lawyer, and not officially in order to help you lie, obviously. But I'm just saying there's a certain amount of negativity involved here, because yes, if you have a lot of money, you get somebody who is very clever. They can help you win your case, even actually if you were in uh, the wrong. Uh, there are other interpretations of Orchei HaDayanim uh, too, but this is one, obviously, one that stands out, I think, for all of us. As a judge, when you see the, um, the people being judged standing in front of you, you have to look at each one as being equally guilty. And when they leave, you have to see them as being innocent. Meaning, the one that's guilty is guilty, the one that's innocent is innocent, obviously. In other words, whatever the judgment was, unless there was no judgment. Sometimes you can have a pshara, you can't have a compromise out of court. The Talmud also recognizes this as being actually a good idea. So it's a, actually a funny thing saying, Rashi says, it's talking about that if the, in the case where a person just needed to take an oath, so if they took the oath, then you still have to look at them as if they are not uh, guilty. So this is a very important point because, as you know, um, people uh, tend to feel like where there is smoke, there's fire. So if somebody is blamed for something, then they already did it. And uh, we know in the state of Israel this has been a problem, but not just here, all over the world. The media likes uh, deciding uh, people's verdicts before it happens. And uh, and people, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire type thing. So here the um, Yehuda ben Tabai says, no, in a court of law, when you see people, pretend that they are both guilty until you know. But when the judgment is over, if there's one guilty and one not guilty, that's it. And if it just meant that one party just had to take an oath to get out of it, then you have to look at both of them as not guilty, even though that's not possible. The point is, don't render judgment further than the judgment is supposed to be. Now, I'd like to read to you something from the um, Avot Rabbi Natan. I told you the commentary um, from the time of the Geonim on this on this one, on this uh, Mishnah. He says, um, "What does it mean? Don't make yourself like Orchea Dayanim." He brings a story. Malamed im bata lebeta midrash. Well, that's the first one. I wanted the second one. It says, if a person is standing in front of you, and you see one of them is poor, and one of them is rich, so there's a double problem here. Problem number one could be, well, I want to help the rich guy because he can help me. Okay? That's a bad judge, obviously. But then you have problem number two that the person might say, well, that guy's so poor. 
How can I find him guilty? He can't afford it. He's been a victim his whole life. And that rich guy, he's privileged. He can deal with it. <laughs> okay, I'll charge him the $500, not the other guy. So he says, Altomar is, is Ketan Ahani. Don't say I'm going to find the poor guy um, not guilty and I'll, um, I'll make the rich guy guilty. Because even going the opposite direction is not true. It's a lie in court. Therefore, the Torah says, Lo takiru pani ba mishpat. You shall not favor anybody in a judgment. Even if you think it's for ethical reasons, you don't favor people in judgment. As it says, kagadon kagadol tishmiun, you have to take uh, an, uh, the, the important and the non-important as equal. And it doesn't matter who's standing in front of you. So, but, I, so I'm saying in a judgment, if somebody's guilty, they're guilty. What does it matter who they are and what they went through in life? On the other hand, what you could do, if necessary, the actual payment of the fine. You can reduce the fine. You can make it easier. That yes, but you can't decide the person is not guilty if they're guilty. It doesn't really matter what they went through in life. When you render the penalty, there you can find reasons for making the penalty less. So Yehuda um, ben Tabai, who's talking about a court, and as I said, he's talking in the negative. He says, number one, don't be like Orchei Hadayanim which I only gave one interpretation here. Rochei Adayani means, um, in a sense, somebody who is fighting for a cause without thinking of the justness of the cause. That's, that interpretation is against that. Another interpretation, by the way, of Rochei Adayani means just deliberate, like we had before. Deliberate, meaning if you hear something, think about it. Don't let it, even if it's something new you didn't uh, know before, think about it, ponder it, and then you will be able to deal with it. And of course, when the two people are standing in front of you, both of them are, should be equally guilty as they're standing in front of you. And when you come to the judgment, so then this judgment, if it renders one guilty and one not, that's the way you have to look at it. If they're in both not guilty because one of them just had to take an oath, then that's the way you have to look at it. You have to try not to get too personal in these judgments. After the judgment was rendered and you found one party guilty, one not, if you feel that the guilty party, the penalty, you want to make it in a certain way, that of course can be done. And that happens very often in courts of law. One last thing I want to mention, and next time we'll talk about Shimon ben Shatach's part of this Mishnah. And that is, as I said to you before, um, at this point, it seems historically, um, Shimon ben Shatach is improving the stand or the, um, the establishment of the Pharisees and improving the court, the Sanhedrin, which is their institution at this time. That's why it appears that both he and, and uh, Yehudim and Tabai are talking about improving an institution. This is something we have to learn in the state of Israel too. If you want to improve the court, you have to start with reforms with the judges and you have to tell the judges what to do. This is exactly what they're doing. Yudha ben Tabai is not addressing the people, he's addressing the judges. Shimon ben Shatak is not addressing the people, the judges, because he wants this to be the best court possible. Because once it's the best court, more, more people are going to follow it. My father used to tell the story that one time they interviewed this fellow uh, who was brought to be the new maestro of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And the Boston Symphony Orchestra at that time in the 1960s was known as having very good string musicians, the ones who played the stringed in instruments. So they brought in the new maestro and he was interviewed and they said to him, uh, maestro, now that you're going to be um, in charge of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, I guess you're gonna work on the other members of the orchestra so they can get to the same level as the string instruments ones, right? So they all should be, all of them will be world-class. He said, no, that's not my intent at all. I'm going to work on the string instrument ones so that they get to such a level that the others will have to catch up. <laughs> so, so the Yudah ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shatach are trying to improve the Sanhedrin, improve the structure of the Sanhedrin, improve the quality of the judges. And because since the Pharisaic um, structure is based on the court, the court needs to be reformed 
both in the people and in the structure, so everybody knows that there's no question about the uh, validity of the court, about the objectivity of the judges, and therefore we can get the, the people to follow us. This is something we have to understand, in my opinion, in the state of Israel uh, too. But another thing should be, uh, another interesting thing, as I said, this idea of uh, um, Shimon ben Shatach creating these reforms seems to have actually implications. In um, the book, the Kuzari, written in the 11th century by Yehuda Levi, Judah Levi, he mentions that during the time of Yehuda ben Tabai was the beginning of the Karaite movement. Now, this is a very strange statement because the Karaite movement actually starts in the 9th century in Babylonia. So, <laughs> where did the Karaites come in here? If anything, there were Sadducees. You didn't need the Karaites, they were already Sadducees. The Karaites were Jews who only believe in the written Torah, and so were the Sadducees. Why did you need Karaites in the Second Temple period? It's a very strange, um, very strange story to say that they started from here, unless he meant that they started from here in the sense that they were like Sadducees. But interestingly enough, the Karaite historians themselves claim that they actually started in the second century during the time of Shimon ben Shatach and Yehuda ben Tabai. And they claim that Yehuda ben Tabai actually represented them. And when he was brought back from Egypt, he was the first original Karaite, uh, in, uh, Karaite in, the, in Jerusalem. And they see themselves different as the Sadducees for some reason. And that, but eventually when Shimon ben Shatach established the Pharisaic um, power again in the Sanhedrin, unfortunately, Yehuda ben Tabai fell on the wayside. Of course, we, there are no resources to prove that. As far as you know, Yehuda ben Tabai was a Pharisee just like Shimon ben Shatach. But it's very interesting that the Karaites see themselves as somehow connecting um, to Yehuda ben Tabai. But what it does seem to show is that there's some type of revolution or reformation that took place during the time of Shimon ben Shatach both by improving the quality of the high court in preparation for the fact that the Pharisees were now going to be the dominant voice in the Jewish community over the Sadducees. And we will continue this topic next week as well, uh, understanding Shimon ben Shatach's um, statement. Shalom, shalom.